morning. Come on, yeah, that's great. Can you see you, Matt? Really? Thank you. You're so accommodating, Matt. Appreciate that. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a warm room, but not quite as warm as 157. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for all being here. This is an important and exciting day for our new administration, signing into law our first budget and delivering on major and shared priorities. Uh, more important, we've delivered a budget that truly meets the moment in so many ways. Uh, delivering historic investments in schools and childcare, extending our lead in clean energy and protecting the environment, expanding access to mental and physical health care, and so much more. This budget makes our state more affordable, competitive, and equitable. It will make a real and meaningful difference in the lives of people across Massachusetts, lowering their costs, expanding access to opportunity, improving the quality of their life. It's a product of shared values and deep collaborative partnership across our administration represented here today, and importantly, with our partners in the legislature. And the Lieutenant Governor and I would like to thank Senate President Karen Spilka, House Speaker Ron Mariano, their teams, including Chair Aaron Michaelwitz and Chair Mike Rodericks, members of all the conference committees and the entire legislature for their work. Members of the Cabinet, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, uh, thank you for your input, your expertise, guidance along the way, and of course, huge thanks to our Secretary of ANF. Matt Gorkowitz and to his team for their hard work, especially Chief of Strategy and Operations and Acting Budget Director Dana Sullivan. Our administration is laser focused on implementing these innovative programs and investments. And in the weeks ahead, you'll see us out there visiting cities and towns, uh, joining with the legislature around the state to share what this really means for our districts, for our communities. We're going to be talking about a major boost to access and higher education. We're relaunching, we're, excuse me, launching Mass Reconnect, our free community college program for students 25 years old and older, in time for students this coming academic year. We're funding early college access and career pathways in high schools, in-state tuition for all established residents in Massachusetts. We're funding historic investments in local public schools, the largest ever dollar increase in K through 12 school funding fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. Universal free school lunches, an investment in childhood nutrition that's also removing a source of stress from our schools and our homes. Increased access to childcare slots and early education that puts the state on a path to universal pre-K. Expanded childcare provider grants, a, a boost for working families, and the small businesses and the nonprofits who serve them. We're making a commitment to meeting this moment of the housing crisis that we're in. This includes funding for our brand new Office of Housing and Livable Communities, 
increase funding for a range of rental vouchers, rehousing assistance, and eviction protections that help keep people out of homelessness. We're extending our lead in clean energy and protecting the environment, funding energy and environmental affairs with an unprecedented 1% of the total budget. $30 million for the Mass Clean Energy Center to help advance leadership in offshore wind and bring benefits to households. $25 million to permanently support food security infrastructure grants. We've seen just this summer how important those grants are. We're funding major investments in transportation, fair share investments in critical highway bridge infrastructure, improved accessibility at MBTA stations, and means-tested MBTA affairs. We're also addressing the mental health crisis, expanding the number of inpatient beds, clinicians, and behavioral health experts across the state. We're investing in safer communities, funding for a new safe neighborhood initiative based on the proven success of community partnerships, as well as enhanced police training and reentry pathways for returning citizens. We're supporting a new era of support for veterans and service members, funding for critical benefits, programs, and services for active duty service members, as well as veterans and their families under our new cabinet level secretariat. The bottom line, this is a budget that meets the moment here in Massachusetts and sets our state up for success. We know there's work left to be done. We're gonna be focusing on finishing the job, getting a tax relief package in place that will lower household costs, incentivize investments, and improve our economic competitiveness. But based on the strength of this budget, and our collaborative efforts, I am confident that we can deliver for the people of Massachusetts. This is an important day. It's a historic day for our administration, and we are grateful for the partnership of the House and of the Senate in all that has been accomplished. Behind numbers are people and policies, and policymaking takes time. This is a budget that got it right and will make a huge difference in the lives of people in the state as well as our trajectory. Thank you. I'd now like to invite up our colleagues to uh, address this room. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to start out by thanking Governor Healy for signing this really historic budget into law today. It may be her first budget, but it won't be the last, and we know there are many more to come, and we look forward to building on this budget. I also want to thank Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for her support of this budget and her really keeping us uh, involved and in being active, and thank you so much. And Secretary Gorkowitz and all of the members of the Healy Driscoll administration for your support and for your leadership in implementing these transformative policies, and that's exactly what these policies are, transformative. I also want to thank my friend and partner, Speaker Mariano, and our colleagues in the House for your continued partnership in working through this. It was a complicated budget, a lot there, and uh, I want to thank you for that. Thanks to Chair Rodericks and the Senate Ways and Means Committee for their tremendous work to get us here and Chair Mikowitz and his team for their hard work as well. And to all of our members, both in the House and the Senate, who have been tireless advocates for so many of these policies and initiatives. We couldn't have done this without them. All of us in this room have spoken a lot about competitiveness lately. And when I look at this budget, that is what I think of. I see investments and policies that will keep us competitive for years to come by supporting working people and families and making our commonwealth more inclusive, more affordable, and more equitable. I'm so pleased that the student opportunity plan that the Senate proposed in January is becoming a reality, working in partnership with the administration and the House as we make tremendous record investments at every single level uh, of education in this budget. 
With the governor's signature, early education will be more affordable with record $1.5 billion investment. Universal school meals will be available to our children so their bellies won't be grumbling in their schools while they're trying to get work done. That will also save families approximately $1,200 per student per year so that they can spend that money on other things for their uh, students. We have a commitment to high quality K-12 education so that every zip code will continue to be fully funded here. And we give every student who wants to go to college an opportunity without worrying about excessive costs or immigration status. In addition, the dream of free community college, which I was so thrilled to share Governor Healy's uh, and becoming closer to reality as we invest in, as she mentioned, the Mass Reconnect is in this, built into this budget for those 25 and over. Thank you, Governor. Free community college for nursing students. Every single community college, all 15, have nursing programs. We have a dire need for nurses, and that is in this program, Free Community College for Nursing Students. It also lays the groundwork for Universal Free Community College next year, and there, the community college system will be working on that. And notably, I'm really happy to see tuition equity is in this budget. This will help build our workforce with students that are here, right here in Massachusetts now, and help these very same students build and reach their dreams. It also makes historic investments in mental health, physical health, at affordable, accessible, and comprehensive mental health and expanded physical health is available to many more of our residents. That includes nearly $600 million to the Department of Mental Health for adult support services, nearly $120 million towards mental health care for our children. Also, we, we really need to invest, continue to invest in that. And investments in early intervention services and family resource center programming. And loan repayment, we continue to build on a loan repayment program to recruit and retain mental health clinicians and behavioral health workers. There is so much more, as the governor noted, uh, like record funding for transportation, both the T and our RTAs. We do focus on regional equity in this budget. Uh, we have record investments in housing, and again, so much more. The bottom line is that this budget is accomplishing so much good for our Commonwealth and again makes Massachusetts more competitive, more inclusive, and more affordable as well as more equitable. So I'm really proud of what we all here have accomplished. And thank you again to everybody who has worked to get us to this point. And I'm looking forward over the coming months to see the impact of these investments and policies in the months and years. Thanks you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Um, it, is, it is good to be here. And I thank the, the governor for inviting us. I didn't get invited to any of the last four. So, <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is a new precedent. So well, we're honored to have I'm, I'm kind of happy to be here. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I do want to begin by thanking the governor and, and her team for most importantly, I think, listening and watching what was going on in the House and in the Senate in making decisions to support some of the initiatives that were important to our members, both the Senate and the, and the House. You know, we, we read a lot about how late this budget was, but I think I'd just like to remind everyone that the two committees in Ways and Means, in the Senate and in the House, were negotiating some tax cuts, a major budget, 
the spending of the millionaires tax all three required in those negotiations between the two bodies with different priorities in each body so we weren't surprised that it went a little long uh, but I'm constantly surprised that everyone seems to have forgotten what was at stake here and what we were trying to accomplish and to come out with a document that is as fair and as transformative as this document is I think is a, is a real credit to the, the administration and a credit to the, the gentleman who worked on the conference committee and women. I think there was, no, I, mean, I don't know if there was a woman, so I take that back. Yes. There was. Yes. You saved me, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> um, and the woman that was on the conference committee. Uh, they, they did yeoman's work. Uh, and I had a lot of things in here that were important to me. Uh, obviously, the, the school lunch program is something I'm, I'm extremely proud of. I taught school for 12 years, and I was on the school committee in Quincy for 16. So I know the stresses of putting a budget together in a school system. I know the stresses of being in the classroom and seeing kids come in from the projects hungry, falling asleep at their desk because they haven't eaten since lunch the day before. What we have done is take a huge transformative step in this country to do away with hunger in our children. You're starting to see ads on TV. You're starting to see recognition of the fact that this is a real problem. And I'm so proud that we've stepped up. And under difficult financial conditions, we made a commitment. We made a commitment, we will keep that commitment, along with the commitment to the college tuitions and all the other things that we've added into this budget that are gonna help people improve their quality of life. I'm especially proud of, uh, proud of the Connect the Care um, trial program. It's gonna allow at least 50,000 more people to get health care and get support for their, their health care payments. These are transformative decisions. You're talking about people who don't have health care, who have to worry about getting a flu shot, have to worry about getting a vaccine shot, let alone a physical. These people now will have an opportunity to get access to health care. You know, the Student Opportunity Act was something that we, we funded I think in six years, and then we, we had a delay of a year. We're not always good in those long-term commitments, but I'm extremely proud of the fact that we are honoring this commitment, and we will continue to honor the six-year commitment, which will now be seven years, but nevertheless, it's a still a commitment, and we will get this done. And I think you see that we have the support of an administration that recognizes the importance of these programs and what they mean to the quality of life in, in, uh, in the Commonwealth. And I am excited, having worked for a while in healthcare, and I know we have some healthcare people here, you know, whatever we can do to get nurses needs to be done. This is just the beginning. Uh, we are going to have to really look at different thing, things that we can do to to increase the amount of nurses that we're producing, the amount of healthcare professionals we, we can put into the marketplace to assist a population that's aging as we speak, being one of those people. I, I wanna make sure we have someone at the hospital waiting for me when I get there. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna support all these programs because it's a smart thing for me to do. Uh, but. Nevertheless, I, I am honored to be here, and I really do want to thank the, the administration and the secretary, wherever you want, oh, there he is over here, uh, for, for really listening uh, and, and engaging in a dialogue with the chairman of Ways and Means, both chairmen, uh, to get to a point where we have things that are gonna have a direct impact on the lives of our constituents. And I, for one, am extremely proud of this, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's why I'm here. 
That's why I'm here today. So I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if this is mine. I don't know. That's not mine. <laughs> uh, well, any questions? Governor, um, I just want to make sure I get so correctly that uh, the budget we signed, one, includes uh, the provision to uh, bring back Chapter 67. And if so, what impact do you think that will have on the current crisis? Yeah. Um, why don't I let Secretary Gorkowitz speak to that uh, specifically, and I'm sure others may have thoughts as well. Well, I think the, the 257 provision. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the 257 provision was something that um, had been in effect uh, during, uh, you know, uh, the COVID uh, crisis, uh, and one that uh, the legislature had uh, included in their uh, versions of the budget. Again, this is an example where, you know, we had launched a lot of uh, great ideas and initiatives in House 1. Others came through the legislative process. 257 happens to be one of those and one that the administration uh, supports. And um, we'll be working with our uh, secretaries over at uh, HLC to uh, ensure the implementation of it. Uh, but mm -hmm. Sorry, and, and just as part of that bigger picture, what impact do you hope it'll have, if any, on the current health care crisis? Well, I think it'll alleviate some some pressures on on homelessness, um, and we think that that's uh, important. Uh, and it's a it's another tool in our in our uh, toolbox on, uh, um, on on trying to address the crisis. There's a lot in this budget, um, almost a hundred uh, twenty one percent increase in prevention programs, one hundred eighty seven million dollars over last year. Um, there's a lot in this budget that we're doing to try to address the the crisis. And again, this is just another tool uh, in our toolbox to to try to uh, to deal with that crisis. Governor, did you issue any videos? Um, yes, uh, in fact, uh, we did. We, there's a veto there of an outside section that proposed to use about $200 million in uh, transitional escrow funds. Um, you'll be able to review the, the list later if you haven't seen it already, but we did it to keep the budget in balance, and we took this action because we felt like at this time it was the right thing to do to not use one-time funding for programs that would have a longer uh, shelf life. So. Um, making cuts is never easy. I think the good news is we, in the process, and I give huge thanks to, of course, the members of the conference committee and also Secretary Gorkowitz and his team, as well as our secretariats who went through to find ways where we could uh, make cuts within programs, trim things that were redundant or where there was otherwise funding available out of, out through the administration so that um, nearly all line items will continue to be uh, funded um, at the levels that we initially proposed in House 1, if not higher in many instances. How much spending did you veto altogether? It's a $205 million on a, a net basis, 273 yeah. gross. Um, the $205 million uh, represents uh, the amount needed to uh, veto the outside section that transfers money from the one-time source, the transitional escrow, to the general fund. I mean, this is all about policy, and policy is only good insofar as it actually works and, you know, is, is effective and we're able to execute. And so um, there were a few instances where, you know, based on some discussion, we ended up returning uh, just to, to move out an effective date, for example, so that we as an administration could get things lined up, um, whether it's databases or, you know, other technical things that we needed to do to be able to operationalize. I think it was just a, you know what was good? Collective common sense, actually, <laughs> from all from all involved, that we needed a little bit more time to be able to, to get it done. Governor, I'm curious about um, for one specific veto, um, if I'm correct, to construct funding from the uh, Kate Pam suicide prevention text line. I'm curious about if that is the case and um, what you think behind that one was. Okay, I'll let Secretary Gorkowitz speak to that, because this does, I, I will say, you know, last year, um, we know that there is a mental health crisis across this country and certainly here in this Commonwealth. We know that many here have invested incredible time, resources, and attention through legislation to address the crisis, whether it's happening uh, in our schools or, or in homes or, you know, just, uh, just with, the, with respect to substance use disorder. It's something that affects uh, and potentially affects every single family and person in this state. So building on the investments made in prior years and the important legislation of the legislature, 
this does include really significant investments in mental health, and we're really excited about that. But with respect to that particular item? Yeah, I'll just, a um, couple things on that. One is this budget does invest significantly in suicide prevention, and the item in question that we vetoed um, is actually funded in another uh, line item in DPH where we're trying to invest in the 988 system. Um, and that has been a significant investment. In fact, we have a million dollar increase over last year spending to support and invest in those uh, types of programs. This was perceived to be uh, a bit redundant in that regard and that this was duplicative of funding that we've tried to invest somewhere else. So we've maintained um, our investment that we filed in House 1 and similar to investments that were made in the prior year, but our investment and our focus has really been trying to um, implement the, the 988 system and make investments there where uh, where it's, uh, it's appropriate. And, and so we've... Um, felt that it was appropriate to do that um, given those other investments. Governor, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Governor, I happen mm -hmm. to know that, that the line item for the um, emergency associated family shelter was $8 million less you know, than what is currently being spent, of course, $5 million. And the wake of the um, shelter crisis, um, the, the state's shelter crisis, the state's shelter system being overwhelmed, um, I just want to know the reason behind that and whether you're seeking to make amendments to increase it. <laughs> Well, let me, uh, we can speak to the specific um, item that, that you're talking about, and then I'll, I'm happy to comment a little bit more broadly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what specific item you're talking about. We're not making any cuts to emergency shelter uh, programming. In fact, this budget uh, is a 21% increase over last year's spending. It's about $187 million and about $78 million more than what we filed in our House 1 budget. So it's a sizable increase in recognition of uh, the crisis we're under. I'm not sure. I think if you're referring to the $18 million reduction, you're talking about EADC, which is a different program outside of uh, shelter. Um, and a lot of that was driven by some updated caseloads that we have um, and some other uh, things that are in effect, but not something that would impact uh, the shelter system or the, uh, the emergency crisis and that we're, we're experiencing. Yeah. And I think, you know, everybody uh, up here and including folks within our administration brings a particular sensitivity to the plight of those who are the most vulnerable among us, and that includes those who are housing insecure. And uh, it's a reason in part why we look to create this housing secretariat that's going to be very focused on driving production and supporting families residents around the state it is also the case though when it comes to what we're experiencing as a state particularly with regard to the influx of newly arrived migrants that no amount of state resources infrastructure is adequate to deal with what is really a humanitarian crisis a geopolitical issue that has no uh, immediate timeline of abating. And that is why I issued the emergency declaration, and we will certainly collectively use all means necessary, but we do need federal assistance in the form of funding as well as work authorizations. Governor, you can clarify. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I yeah. just wanted to clarify, what, is the, what, what actually has the $18 million reduction, what's the difference between that program and the shelter services? There are um, different programs is what he's, it, yeah, they're different programs. And the important thing here, as I said at the outset, um, is that, you know, we put forward proposed investments in House 1. Our colleagues in the legislature um, increased investments uh, on certain, on certain uh, items. And what we ended up coming out with uh, today in a budget that uh, is funding, that is, that is maintaining, you know, for nearly everything, it's maintaining or increasing, in fact, what we initially proposed. But we can get you specifics on, on any particular line items. Governor, yes. Sales, yeah, um, Tiffany and then Lisa, sorry. Uh, the sales tax raises that exist in there. Do you think this incentive is worthwhile? Does it really bring people who historically struggle in the job base of summer? I am, you know, we work to get the budget ready, and uh, I'll make my shopping list. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm looking forward to uh, this weekend. And just a reminder, thank you, Saturday and Sunday tax-free holiday it's great especially for our small businesses and we're an administration that champions uh, small business and we want to encourage people uh, hopefully the weather holds uh, to be out there and supporting our small businesses but tax-free holiday do the numbers show that people actually come out during these two days i think it's an important i think it's an important holiday and one that we'll continue to recognize Last this year question. yeah Uh, I think that the important thing is, I think we all recognize that tax relief is something we want to accomplish for purposes of making life more affordable for residents. 
uh, more competitive for our state. There are a lot of good ideas already out there and on the table, and this is the work of government and policymaking, so I know people will be hard at, hard at work in the days and weeks ahead and look forward to that process. Can I just add something? I do want to mention that so much of what's in the budget is a form of relief for individuals and working families. As mentioned, the school meals, the universal school meals, translates to $1,200 dollars per student per family. So just imagine if there's more than one student, how much that family saves. The school construction, because of COVID and inflation, that we put 100 million in for overruns because of that. Therefore, the communities, the 30 communities that are experiencing these overruns do not have to put that on the backs of property taxpayers to pay for those overruns. The state is covering that. And there's so much more in terms of food and, and housing and uh, clothing allowances for, for kids and, and so much more. But we will continue to work on that as well. Well, the fiscal picture always factors in. And as the speaker alluded to earlier, there were a number of things in motion under consideration, which is why I'm so pleased that we were able to emerge today with a budget that makes the kind of investments in our people and in our state that are really gonna power us forward. We know there's remaining work to do. Our job isn't done. Uh, we're anxious to move ahead with the tax package, but I just wanna uh, thank once again uh, all who've been involved uh, over the course of, of time to, to make today a reality because it's about making life better for people in this state. So thank you to Mr. Speaker, to the Senate President, uh, to the Chairs of Ways and Means, uh, to our Lieutenant Governor, to all of our administration and secretaries who really got to work in digging in on things, and especially to Secretary Gorkowitz and the ANF team for doing the hard and good work to get to this point today. So Thank you. I don't think we've seen the numbers yet. Right? We'll be, we'll be talking yeah. about FY23 later this week. Um, we'll be releasing the final FY23 numbers, and the process to close out FY23 has already started with um, by reaching out to the chairs and talking about uh, that in partnership with them. So there's more to come on yeah. 23. We'll give you the numbers real time, though. Okay. Okay. Yes. Go, go, go. 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 go.